The Untold Stories of Fort Myers 2 is being made possible in part by Bill Smith Appliances, the City of Fort Myers City Council, Goldstein, Buckley, Seckman, Rice, and Pertz, the Lee County Government County Commission, the Lee Trust for Historic Preservation, and the Gannett Foundation. You'll put the, uh, the board feet out anywhere this morning? Yes. Where? Yes, Over there? The same old place. The same old place. What? The same old place. Oh. Mm. Bye. Morning, Miss Edison. Morning, Freddy. Did the flat man get off early this morning? Yes, sir. Memories, recollections, facts, and figures make up the life stories we pass down from generation to generation. These oral and written histories about the people and places of our past shape how we live today. Together, let's relive some of the untold stories about Fort Myers in the last half of the 20th century, its special people and places, and the characteristics that make this rapidly growing area of Southwest Florida a unique place to live and work. We'll hear about the growth of Fort Myers as an economic and cultural center, the shifting of the population and shopping areas southward, and the desegregation of buildings and schools. We'll also learn about the introduction of cultural and historical institutions and tourist attractions and the revitalization of the historic downtown area. In 1947, the city of Fort Myers renewed efforts to buy Thomas Edison's winter home to preserve it as an educational resource and a memorial to the inventor. Edison's widow deeded it to the city for one dollar and it immediately became a tourist attraction. A museum housing a collection of phonographs and other artifacts was later added. As early as 1886, Edison had built these homes here in Fort Myers. He, over the years, he brought his family and his friends. Um, they much enjoyed playing games, fishing out on the Caloosahatchee River, taking boat rides on the Caloosahatchee River, uh, picnicking, camping, and just visiting on the wonderful verandas that we have here. In fact, before the war, uh, there was a lot of talk by Mrs. Edison about establishing a library in, the, in honor of her husband. Uh, that uh, idea died, and uh, there was then presented the idea of a university to be known as Edison University. And uh, that idea was uh, discussed at length. It also died. And finally, in 1947, Mrs. Edison said, I'm ready to deed uh, the property to the city. When Mrs. Edison turned the estates over to the city of Fort Myers, right away, people wanted to go through the homes and gardens. And I found a record where there were about 9,000 people who did that right away. In 1948, Mr. Halgram, uh, then, who is the gentleman that Mrs. Edison wanted to be in charge of the estates, had a record of visitors of 35,000 people who visited the homes and the gardens. Fort Myers continued to attract Major League Baseball teams and players for spring training. They included the Pittsburgh Pirates, the Boston Red Sox, and the Minnesota Twins. Baseball has been a part of Fort Myers since the 1920s, and originally the um, uh, Philadelphia Athletics and Connie Mack came down here and had their winter training facilities here. Following World War II, uh, the um, Pittsburgh Pirates came and trained in Fort Myers for quite a number of years and they refurbished a bit the uh, Terry Park at the time. So we've had uh, spring training in Fort Myers since the 1920s and it's been a wonderful experience for a lot of people. After World War II, Fort Myers was on the brink of change. Flight training camps established during the war brought many new residents into the area in the 1950s. I think what's set the stage for uh, the development of Lee County in the 60s was the war and, and bringing uh, new people into the, to the area. During the war there were approximately 20,000 servicemen and women stationed at both Buckingham and Page Field. Um, after the war was over, many of whom had um, created relationships here in southwest Florida, 
Um, some of them had married, some had met people, others even brought their families down afterwards and created a real um, growth boom at the time. Florida was becoming a real tourist market, so with the, the influx of these um, ex-servicemen and women that were stationed here, in addition to, to new people as well, uh, the area really began to grow. I graduated from law school in 1948 and came to Fort Myers. Uh, there were about 23 or 24, maybe 25 attorneys in town at that time. I checked with the Bar Association and they tell me now there are not over 900, I think it was 997 attorneys practicing law in Lee County at the present time. When we had about 12 public schools uh, back, in the night, back in 1950, uh, we now have 72 public schools. They have 11,000 employees and they're taking care of 72,000 students. Uh, there are six charter schools, 72 public schools, 70,000 students. Big change. Disaster struck in 1960 when Hurricane Donna swept through the region. Federal relief funds to rebuild brought a boom to the area. A lot of us that went through Donna, we kind of think of our, term, our life in terms of before Donna and after Donna. It probably was one of the uh, reasons for sparking the growth in the 60s because there was so much repair that needed to be done. Right up until 1960, 1962, we were, we were a sleepy little southern town. And then in the 60s, we began to transform into probably a Midwestern community as opposed to a southern community with the influx of all the new people. The majority of people that came here in the 60s were retirees and uh, looking for a better climate and looking for an inexpensive place to live. Well, the property appraiser's office indicated that the assessed value in 1969 came to $514,386,790, a little over $500 million. The current assessment, $60 billion. The commercial center of Fort Myers also began to change in the 60s. Edison Mall, built in 1965, altered the nature of downtown Fort Myers and reoriented the community southward. The downtown area of Fort Myers, which was 1950, uh, was the hub of the town. The Sears was there, Penny's was there. Downtown Fort Myers was, was the center of commerce for all of Southwest Florida. We were the largest community here that was the only real established downtown in the area. People would travel in uh, to come and shop for the weekend. The early development, or, or move away, you might say, from downtown Fort Myers started in, uh, in 1960, actually. And there was a, a new shopping center, it was the, the highlight of the town, called Boulevard Plattison. And it had a Grants uh, food fair market and um, also a Woolworths. And that, that was high cotton back in those days. And people used to come down there on Friday and Saturday nights just to walk up and down the sidewalk. And then in 1965, uh, George Sanders uh, began uh, putting together a shopping center on the present location of Edison Mall. That center was the first time that anywhere in the country that a Penny's, a Sears Roebuck, and a Moss Brothers uh, was in the same center because the thinking was back then if you had more than one department store, they would uh, hurt each other. So it was a big draw to head down, uh, spend the day inside in an air-conditioned place as opposed to going from store to store downtown. People quit coming downtown, and unfortunately the downtown area started to deteriorate. In the 1950s, the races were still segregated in Fort Myers. Churches and schools were separate. Even the railroad station had separate facilities for black and for white travelers. Schools in Lee County were not integrated until the late 1960s. The Dunbar community at that time was basically all black. The churches, the high schools, the elementary schools, all of the public institutions that served African Americans in that period was all black. The grocery stores, the movie theater, the cemeteries, all of those areas of life in Dunbar were all black. The blacks lived in their own neighborhoods and the whites lived in theirs. 
the blacks went to their schools and the whites went to theirs. We had the proverbial uh, drinking fountains, black drinking fountains, black waiting rooms. The old um, Atlantic Coastline train depot at the time, of course, was a train station. But if you look at the old blueprints, it's clearly noted a colored waiting room and a white waiting room. There are two sets of bathrooms, two ticket offices, two ticket windows. Lee County was, in fact, one of the, the very last counties in the country to become um, integrated. The integration process of schools in Fort Myers and in Lee County took place on a complete scale, I would say, around 1969. And this happened 15 years after the decision on the Brown versus the Board of Education. I be became a public school teacher in 1967. And my first year of teaching was at Franklin Park Elementary School, an all-black school in Dunbar. My second year, I transferred to Bay Shore elementary school in North Fort Myers. And uh, it was an experience for me and for the students that I taught. I was teaching first grade and I went to the sink to wash my hands. And the children got very quiet and they were all looking at me very strangely as if to say, well, the color is gonna come off, you know, or something of that, of that nature. But later on, it dawned on me that apparently this is what these very little children were looking for. There were mixed reactions to uh, integration requirements of the federal law with the busing and, and that sort of thing. Uh, there were some people that were okay with it. There were others who felt uh, that it was against all tradition of, of the South. Uh, I've heard quite a few stories about um, how it was and the things that happened here. One of the gentlemen was telling me about his father who owned the, the soda fountain, saw a, a group of uh, black men coming in. And when they arrived in, he put a sign on the door, said soda fountain is closed, and never reopened his soda fountain. The realization that he would have to serve everybody, he would rather close his business. In 1991, the desegregation order was, the district was under desegregation order, and one of the ways we could get out from under that was a, um, a choice plan, and developing a magnet school became out of that. I went out, I recruited parents to send their children to me, and from that, Edison Park was born again, and it is now a fabulous arts magnet school. We still teach reading and math and writing and science and social studies. What's changed with curriculum are the tools that we now use and the difference in the expectation. I have children in fifth grade who now can do a PowerPoint presentation, they can do PageMaker, they can create their own newspaper. Kids love to be there. They love the arts, they love to dance, they love music, um, they love to learn. And um, it's, it's neat to see kids excited about learning. Edison Park opened its doors in 1927. The cornerstone was laid in 1926 by Thomas Edison, by the way, and it was the first auditorium that the community used as a community auditorium. When I arrived as principal there in 1991, um, much of the auditorium in the balcony had been sectioned off as a classroom, and it was uh, just very run down. And because of choice, the uh, district decided to uh, renovate the school and uh, I really did uh, fight for the integrity of that building because it is such a beautiful old building. There were no public higher education opportunities in Fort Myers until the early 60s when Edison Community College opened in downtown Fort Myers. Edison Community uh, College started first uh, in the Gwen Institute downtown on uh, 2nd Street and then when uh, the money was appropriated uh, for the uh, campus at the present location, well, it moved out there. Well, I, I think when I would look into my own background, I was the child of uh, uh, farmers and not much money at all. And uh, our parents just really did everything on earth to see that my own family got an education. Well, I get very enthusiastic when I mention Edison Community College because prior to Edison, um, this a uh, five county area was just an educational desert. It took another 32 years for the region to get its own regional public university. Florida Gulf Coast University opened its doors in August of 1997, 
Finally, residents no longer had to leave the area in order to pursue a four-year baccalaureate, or in some cases, a graduate degree. As we entered the 21st century, Fort Myers' public education system was serving the full range of its residents' educational needs. During the 60s and 70s, three important cultural arts groups emerged to address the visual, music, and performing arts interests of the area. Lee County Alliance for the Arts, the Southwest Florida Symphony, and the Barber B. Mann Performing Arts Hall, which was built on the Edison College campus. Barbara Mann has been a cultural icon in the area since the 1920s when she performed for Thomas and Mina Edison. Well, I came here in uh, 1923 and culture was here before I came. Even though it was said this was a cultural desert and I didn't find it so. They had a little theater, they had bands, and they had beautiful houses on First Street and those people usually had Victrolas and they played music from the operas. In my school days, I had the starring role. And so then my sister and I sang duets and we were known as the Balch Sisters. And we appeared in clubs and downtown. They had a pier where it had all the productions. We sang there very often. It turned out to be quite a successful thing. So I'd just been playing with music all my life. Barbara told me she had the lead role in the senior play and that Mrs. Edison was present uh, in the audience during the play. And at the conclusion of the play, when the curtain came down, Mrs. Edison presented her with a, a bouquet of roses, uh, which was something that was probably practiced on Broadway, but uh, certainly before that time, not in Fort Myers. I had worked for a long time trying to get a adequate facility for the programs that we were bringing, which were national and international. And uh, I was finally appointed by the chairman of, of the county commission to head up a committee that would try to find ways or a way to get to it. We worked very hard. I had a son, Frank Mann, was in the state legislature. He called me one night at 10 o'clock and said, Mom, you're going to get your haul. I was, I just couldn't believe it. But he had gotten, I think, $13 million appropriated to the college. The first person that came here was Eileen Farrell. She was well known on radio. And she came back ten, well, for our 10th anniversary. Then we had Isaac Stern and we had Lily Pons. Now that name won't mean much to the contemporary people, but she was very glamorous. Uh, and then we had, uh, oh, the Boston Pops. Barbara Mann is a, uh, B. Mann is a friend of mine, friend of Lloyd's, and we've known her ever since we've ever been in town. And uh, the thing she goes after, it's, uh, it's a bulldog approach. She just won't give up. And people know and uh, love her for what she's done in this community. Barbara B. Mann is one of the most beloved uh, persons uh, in Fort Myers and uh, all of us love her and we think about her uh, as we go back Barbara B. Mann Hall on Summerlin. One of the wonderful things about having a theater like Barbara B. Mann is that it does bring a lot of cultural activities to and performances to the community as a whole but also to the children. When I drive by and see that big name up there, I can't believe that it's my name, you know. And it's an interesting thing about the people that go down there. They're so surprised when they, if I'm introduced to somebody, oh, she's still alive? You know, people, you're not supposed to have your name on your building until, unless you're dead. I'm still alive. <laughs> Interest in the history of Fort Myers grew in the 80s. The old Atlantic Coast Line Railroad Station in downtown Fort Myers became the Fort Myers Museum of History in 1982. Lee Trust was created more recently and is actively working to restore Fort Myers' historic homes. The Southwest Florida Museum of History uh, is located in the uh, old Atlantic Coast Line train depot. And that was a train station until 1971 and then the building was abandoned. Um, it sat vacant for quite a long time. In, in fact, the roof even caved in. And it was, um, came to a point where the city who took ownership of the building uh, had a choice. It was either tear it down or renovate it. 
Um, at that time, the um, Southwest Florida, or at, at the time, the Fort Myers Historical Society uh, was very active in fundraising to save that building. Lee Trust is, is the new kid on the block. We're proactive in historic preservation. We get involved with political issues. We get involved with uh, preserving endangered structures. The Burroughs Home was deeded to the city of Fort Myers, and then it just sat there, and I kept pounding on the mayor's door to do something about the Burroughs Home, and finally the mayor says, okay, Bill, if you want something done by, about the Burroughs Home, you're the chairman of the committee. So uh, I accepted that challenge and uh, put a good group together, and, and we got the home put on the National Register, and we got the home restored. The historic structures, particularly in, in the historic neighborhoods and in the historic downtown, um, are an important reminder of what we were, and they can be a building block for what we're going to be in the future. The Henry Ford home was another successful acquisition that has added to Fort Myers' reputation as a tourist destination. The Ford home uh, was an integral part of the whole uh, Edison scene. One day, I was uh, going down McGregor Boulevard uh, in my car on the way home from work, and uh, my car suddenly turned into Mrs. Bigger's driveway. I don't know why I did that. That was the, the start of the discussions. The contract was uh, for a million uh, five hundred thousand dollars, which we thought was a very fair price at that time. In 1990, we had the opening of the Henry Ford home, and that's when the attendance was 482,000. The Imaginarium, a hands-on children's science center in downtown Fort Myers, opened in the late 1990s and has proved to be an educational resource as well as a tourist attraction. The Imaginarium is, is, bases itself on, as a science museum and a technology museum and a place of education. Uh, and that works very well with the other attractions here, especially with the Edison Estates, with Edison uh, being, being such a pioneer of, of science and technology and invention. Uh, the Imaginarium works very closely with uh, the Inter Inventors Fair every year and works with the schools uh, to help foster new and young inventors uh, in the spirit of Thomas Edison. Preservation of old Fort Myers history continues. An ambitious plan to rebuild and revitalize the historic downtown area has gained support. Downtown is the, it's the heart of a community because that's where the history and the heritage uh, evolved. Fort Myers is a unique community in that it has many of its older building stock still intact. So our challenge was to come in and, and find investors willing to buy the buildings and put the money into the restoration to bring them back the way they were um, back in the early days and, and really uncover uh, that beautiful fabric that we have. What they're trying to do here is to, to create a downtown that people want to come to again. Uh, create businesses that will draw in uh, the tourism, uh, attractions like the museum and the Edison Estates and the Imaginarium. The biggest challenge I think facing downtown right now is to attract uh, more retail uh, business into town. Um, we've been very successful in attracting new residential development. If you go down to First Street, I think you see the most visible evidence. Buildings like the Earnhardt Building that used to house McCrory's. A young developer came in, bought the building, uh, completely restored it. It looks today identical to what you would have seen had you walked down that street in 1914. We have the original furnishings and personal effects of Thomas Edison and, and Mina Edison. We have books that he read, he enjoyed reading and he has little notes in his books. Um, but we have personal effects as simple as a, a set of dentures, and they're in a little silver case that, is, um, that, that says that it was given to Thomas by Mina Edison. In the last year, um, we began the res renovations at the guest house because that did have the most uh, damage, uh, to structural damage, uh, so it was the most important to stabilize. And so we now have almost completed that restoration. The city has purchased eight acres on the north side of the estates that is non-historic property. And we'll be moving the parking lot over there. We'll be expanding the nursery and the propagation area. Um, the museum's going to uh, become larger. And we're going to be offering more experiences for our visitors in the future that they can 
come and walk the grounds and, and take the tours on the historic property, but as well go back over to the east side and be able to um, do interactive uh, museum displays and work in the propagation area, um, learn much more about uh, the specifics of what especially Thomas Edison did here on site. And that will be a lot of fun, we feel, for our visitors. Inspirational memories and stories live on in Fort Myers. A growing recognition of the value of the historic past leads to optimism about preserving it for future generations. It is important to preserve buildings, artifacts, photos, and other memorabilia about our past. Fort Myers and Lee County have been such a blessing to me and I feel so fortunate to have been born and raised here and lived here all of my life. I think the citizens of Fort Myers are so fortunate to have such a beautiful downtown. I do love Fort Myers and I do love the arts community in Fort Myers. We like to see old things that we develop a passion for preserved. I think it's important to preserve our history because I think we need to look at our history to learn how we're going to act in the future. Downtown is the heart of our community and for that reason, if for none other, we need to preserve and, and enhance that history and that heritage. Culture does not knock down doors to get in. You have to encourage them and show them what, an, what a treat it is. To purchase a DVD or VHS of this program, call 1-800-824-0030 or log on to our website, wgcu.org. Please refer to the show title and episode number on your screen.